As a computer science teacher, I get asked all the time, how can I learn software development? How can I get into programming? In this episode, we're going to provide some tips for aspiring programmers. Welcome to Copec Explained Software, the podcast where we make computing intelligible. All right, Dave, this week we're doing something a little bit different. We're offering up advice for our listeners, advice for folks who are looking to start a new adventure in programming. And I guess the first place to start that adventure is if someone wants to learn to program, what language should they choose? Yeah, you know, this is a question that often leads to analysis paralysis. Instead of actually learning to program, people spend way too much time thinking about which language should they choose? And then sometimes they get started on one language and then they go and switch to another language because they start thinking maybe they chose the wrong language or their friends tell them, well, you should really learn this other language. I'm actually going to tell you something surprising, which is I don't think it really matters that much which language you choose given two criteria that I do think are important. The first criteria is I think you should choose a popular language. The reason I think you should choose a popular language is so that there's tons of free learning resources, so that there's tons of books, tons of videos, tons of online courses, and tons of questions answered on the web. That way, any question you have when you inevitably hit a roadblock, because when people are learning pro programming, they're going to inevitably hit roadblocks, you'll be able to do a web search and get the answer to your question. So I'm not saying you have to choose the most popular language in the world. I'm just saying choose a reasonably popular language so that all of those resources exist and so that any questions you have are a web search away. So that's my first criteria. My second criteria, choose a language that is related to a project that you want to complete. Let me give you an example. If you're interested in doing a data science project or you're interested in doing backend web development, well then maybe Python is a good choice because there are libraries for doing both of those things in the Python ecosystem. Well, if you're interested in making mobile apps, then maybe learning Kotlin for Android development or Swift for iOS development makes a lot of sense. If you're interested in doing web development, then probably learning JavaScript along with HTML and CSS, those are the languages of web development, front-end web development at least, makes sense. So choose a language that's related to a project that you ultimately want to complete or an area that you want to get into so that you stay motivated. So my two criteria for you are choose a popular language and choose a language that's related to an area that you want to be involved in. Other than that, just choose a language. Don't get into analysis paralysis and stick with that language. Don't keep changing languages. Stay with that same language until you feel that you've mastered it. And that might take a while. We'll talk more about this a little bit later, but learning a programming language properly is probably going to take you six months to a year just to learn enough that you feel like you're quote unquote dangerous in that language. What are some of the resources that folks should gather as they're starting to learn to program once they've chosen their language? Well, the great thing is if you do choose a popular language, there's going to be a lot of great free resources. There's going to be free online courses. There's going to be free video tutorials. There's even going to be free books online. And now everyone's a different kind of learner. You know, some people learn better by doing projects. Some people learn better by reading a book. And some people learn better by watching videos. And it really depends on the type of learner you are, which of these resources, and you know that before you go into this, right? You know what's worked well for you in the past. And you can always try multiple of these different modalities and just pick the one that works best for you. Now, no matter which one you pick, I suggest that you get a book as well. And the, uh, let me explain to you why I suggest that you have a definitive resource that is a book. Even if you're mainly doing videos or mainly doing an online course, I suggest you work through a book as well because... At any point that you're in a book, the author can assume the knowledge of all of the prior chapters. So you have one voice throughout the learning experience of the book, and the author always knows how much you know, even though it's not interactive, even though that's not a, a living, so to speak, person that you're talking to as you read that book. They can assume the exact amount of knowledge that you have at any point in the book because they can assume that you've read all the prior chapters, and you should actually read the chapters in order, of course. This is a big advantage 
because I see a lot of people run into the problem of going to one random online tutorial and then going to an online random video. And at each of those points, there's a lot of stuff included in those tutorials that they don't already know. And the person who made those piecemeal tutorials has no way of knowing what you don't already know. And so therefore you get into this problem of uh, ha not being able to answer the question you have right now because you don't have all the prerequisite knowledge that that tutorial assumed. And so the great thing about the, a book or a course for that matter is that as you go through at any given point, if you're going in order, the author or the instructor always knows exactly how much you know. So I would always have some kind of backbone book or backbone course that you're following along with, even if you're using other resources as well. So once you've chosen your language and gathered up your resources, is there any specific software that would be helpful for someone? Well, as we talked about in our prior episode, what is a programming language, which I will link to in the show notes, when you write code, you're actually just writing a text file. And those text files can be opened up in any text editor. But the thing is, you want an environment that's actually going to help you as you go along. So you want an editor that is specific to the programming language that you're learning. And there's going to be a lot of them for any popular programming language, with a couple exceptions. So you want two features that you must have as you're learning programming. The first is syntax highlighting. This is where different parts of your program automatically get colored with different colors to show how they fit together. So for example, uh, functions that are built into the language, like built-in library functions are gonna have one color. Functions you define yourself are gonna have another color. The variables you define will have another color. Keywords in the language will have a different color. This will actually help you learn. You know, there's actually been studies about this that uh, the, the different coloring of different parts of speech, so to speak, even though this is not speech, helps people learn a language and it helps people learn programming as well. Next feature you should have is autocomplete. And this one's a little harder to find because not every programming editor will actually have this for every language. But there definitely will be one that has this if you're choosing a popular language. So you want an editor that is autocomplete because when you're first learning, you don't want to have to go look every single thing up and you don't want to have to memorize every single name of every function and every built-in keyword. And so by having some editor with autocomplete, you're going to be able to get through your first few programming projects that's just a little bit faster and it's going to be a little bit less frustrating. So those are the two features you should really look for. Make sure your editor has syntax highlighting, also known as syntax coloring, and make sure that it has autocomplete. And you will definitely, if you're choosing any popular language, be able to find an editor that has both of those. All right. So you've chosen your language, you've got your book, you've got your text editor, then what do you do? Well, then's the actual hard part, right? Then you actually have to work through all of the exercises in that course or that book that you're using. And as you go through that book or course, I'm going to make a couple of recommendations. The first is that you do it in order, and I mentioned that earlier. The second is that as you see code snippets, instead of just downloading all the source code, for example, if you buy a book or you get a free book, there's probably going to be a link on the book's website that says, here, download all the source code from the book. And then you could just open that source code and, you know, and then run it. But what you really want to do is actually type it in. This is, again, something that's been shown in studies that helps people remember, helps build that muscle memory of actually typing in the code as you read the book or go through the course. I know it sounds silly. You might actually, let's say you got a physical book. You actually have this physical book open next to your keyboard. You could have just gone to the website and downloaded all the code, but instead you're going to actually look at the book on one side, your keyboard on the other, and your screen in front of you and type in each of the little snippets. It's actually going to help you learn. Next recommendation, practice, practice, practice. Do all the exercises in the book or the course that you're using. Programming is kind of like any other skill in that it doesn't just come from just, you know, seeing someone else do it. You actually need to do it yourself. You actually need to practice. It takes thousands and thousands of hours of practice and writing code before you become a competent programmer. This is similar to kind of learning another human language. Like you can watch someone else speak Spanish but that doesn't mean that you're going to be able to speak Spanish until you practice speaking Spanish over the course of thousands of hours and several years. 
It's the same thing with programming. It's a big task and it requires a lot of practice. And I suggest not just doing those exercises in the book or the course, but also having some project that you're interested in doing as you go. And there might be many of them as you go. And that way you're going to stay motivated. If you're not just doing something because you have to do it, but you're also doing a project that you want to do as you go, that's really going to keep the motivation level high. And you know what? It's also going to be an interesting kind of test. If after doing the exercises in the book or course that you're doing, you find that you don't want to do your own project, that might actually be an indicator that you don't like programming that much, which is okay. Because that means you went through this process and you learned that about yourself, that really this is not something for you. But if you don't find yourself motivated to actually do like outside projects, like projects that, that you just find interesting, then maybe you're not really that interested in programming to begin with. And that's what you actually learned from this journey. If after you do the exercises from the book or from the course, you say, you know what, I don't want to touch code again today or maybe I don't want to touch code again this week. Well, maybe that means you really don't like programming that much. There should be kind of a natural inclination. It's terrible to do something as involved as programming and force yourself through it if it's not really something you enjoy. And you know, as a college instructor, I see this not that often, but I do see a couple of people that it happens to every year. You know, they're able to do all the work for the course and they, um, they, they, they do it fine. But when you talk to them and you, and you say, well, do you really like programming? Do you really enjoy programming? Do you program on your own time? And they say no. Well, that's a good indication. Maybe this isn't a good direction for them because programming is not just something that, um, that you can really become good at by just doing it on the clock, so to speak, at least when you're first learning. There's a lot of debate about whether people should have to program outside of work when they have it as a job. But I'm talking about when you're learning. When you're learning, the amount of work you're going to do for you know, a book or a course might be tens of hours of programming work, but it takes hundreds of hours, thousands of hours to really become a competent programmer. So if you don't have that motivation to do it on your own time beyond just what's assigned to you from that book or course, then you know what? You're probably never going to really get to the level that you want to be at to actually do something interesting with it. Do you have any general advice for folks who are starting starting out as programmers on how to approach things? Well, we talked about practice, but you know, another element to this is actually reading code. So practice is about writing code. So maybe you're doing those exercises or you're doing that project that you wanted to do. But just like a great human language writer, a writer of code needs to actually read. So, you know, there's a saying in human language that to be a great writer, you need to be a great reader. What do they mean by that? They mean that when you actually read other people's work, you learn about the use of language. You learn about interesting ways to express yourself. You learn about uh, grammar, actually. You learn about spelling. You learn about syntax by reading other people's words. Well, the same is true about code. To become a great programmer, you actually need to become a reader of other people's code. And so, of course, there's going to be the code in that course or that book that you're doing, but it's also a good idea to go check out some open source projects. A popular site for that is GitHub. Just go on GitHub, look up some projects that you're interested in, and read other people's solutions to them. There's nothing wrong with that as long as you don't go and copy what they did and then claim it was your own. Uh, there's nothing wrong with otherwise going and reading other people's solutions, assuming this is not for academic credit that you're doing this, of course, or something like that. Um, but if this is for your own interest, go and read that project that you're interested in and read a lot of it. I'm saying that you need to both practice writing code, but you also need to practice reading code. Another couple of things I'll just mention. Being detail-oriented is actually really important for programming. You know, once I spent 24 hours on a bug I was working on for a, a project for a client, so this was actually something I was being paid to do, because I forgot to put a comma in the right place. I had the comma in the wrong place, and that caused a subtle problem with the program that led to a really hard-to-find bug that took me 24 hours to discover. If you have even one character off in a program, you change the meaning of the program. I'm not saying your programs have to be perfect. Any program of any significant complexity is not going to be perfect. It's going to have bugs. What I'm saying is, though, you need to strive for perfection. You need to be detail-oriented because every character matters in a program. 
And something I've noticed over the years is that people who aren't detail oriented generally have a hard time learning programming because they get very, um, they struggle with the fact that every, that they need to be so careful and they need to make sure that every single bit is in line. Uh, and so if that's not your personality type, if you're not a detail oriented type of person and you can't manage to put yourself in that mindset, it's very possible that programming might not be for you. So keep that in mind that people who, who can't, aren't able to pay attention to details are always going to struggle in general with programming. Last thing, and I think this might be actually the most important piece of advice that I can give to people who are thinking about learning to program, is to have realistic expectations. What do I mean by that? Well, I said earlier on that it's probably going to take six months to a year just to master a single programming language, and you won't even really have mastered it at that point. You'll just be competent in it maybe after six months to a year. If you think about it, in colleges, when people are pursuing a computer science degree, Usually, there's actually two prerequisite programming courses before they get to the more interesting programming or computer science courses. So usually, you'll take like an introductory programming course and like an intermediate programming course. And that will be two semesters, and two semesters in college is basically a year. And that is really how long it takes. It takes, depending on how fast you work and how much you want to practice on your own, but it really does take six months to a year just to get to a basic level of being able to do some interesting things. And that still might not mean that you're able to do that interesting project that you envisioned when you first started learning. So when I, when I say have realistic expectations, I mean realize that it's going to take a long time. This is a big subject, learning to program. There are many facets to it. And it is as hard for many people as learning another human language. And it means that you need to be thinking and in a mindset of positivity about all the small accomplishments that you make along the way so that you stay motivated. Because it's very easy when you start realizing just how much there really is to it. There's a lot to making an app. There's a lot to even making a website. When you realize how much there really is to it, it's easy to get demotivated. It's easy to get overwhelmed. So take the small victories. Every time you successfully complete one of those exercises in that course or book that you're following, you know, pat yourself on the back, take a little victory lap. Every time you complete some small project that you wanted to do on your own, even if it's not the big project that you envisioned when you first started, take a little victory lap. The cool thing about computer programming, which is kind of similar to mathematics, where it originally comes from, is that there are definite solutions to problems. So you are definitely going to have that victory when you successfully solve an exercise, when you successfully get some project that you're interested in working. There's no in-between. Things either work or they don't. And so you're going to have all those little victories and you need to relish them because it really is easy to get demotivated because it really does take quite a bit of time to get to the point where you're going to be able to do something really sophisticated in the programming world. So from the beginning, it's good to have realistic expectations. So I guess the last thing is just to offer up good luck to those folks who've decided to start programming. Um, and hopefully they are relishing in the, the small victories and are going to go far in this next year. Absolutely. And again, I would just say, you know, if you don't find it fun, stop. You know, there is some, there's a certain amount of drudgery you need to get through. There's enough basics you need to get through. So I'm not saying stop after a week, but if you've been doing it for a few months and you really find, you know, you're not enjoying this, then it's possible that you've just been going down a path that you don't enjoy. So maybe it is the learning resource that you were using, but it might also be that really this is not exactly what you thought it was. But the great thing is because there's so many free resources out there, it doesn't cost you anything to try. All these programming languages today are free. You know, if you were learning programming back in the 1980s, you would actually have to pay for usually for a compiler. Um, you'd have to pay for books, but you can get all that stuff for free today. So give it a shot. Give it some time. There's a lot of like basic stuff you have to get through before you can do anything interesting. But once you get to that point, if you find yourself not motivated, that's okay too. That means that you just learned something about yourself. All right. Well, thanks for joining us this week. We really appreciate it. Rebecca, how can people get in touch with us on Twitter? We're at Kopec Explains, K-O-P-E-C-E-X-P-L-A-I-N-S. And we really appreciate people stopping by on Twitter and telling us about topics that you're interested in us covering in the future. And we also want to remind you, don't forget to leave us a review on your podcast player of choice. It really helps other people find out about the show. 
All right. We hope you have a great week and we'll talk to you next week. Thanks for listening.